right, everyone. Welcome. This is I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to the Dice Center. With me is my co-host, Holly Vassell. Say hi, Holly. Hi. All right. She's here to help me talk about my top 100 games. Today we're talking about numbers 51 through 55, so let's get right into that. Number 55, ladies and gentlemen, is Tribune. Now, Tribune's a recent game, and yet it still made it on the list. Part of that is because of its theme. I really do enjoy the theme of the ancient Roman times, and you can see on the board that that's kind of brought through. You can't see as well because it's not close enough, but you'd be able to see all the little people walking around in ancient Rome. But the whole aspect of Tribune, which I really enjoy, is the fact that you're trying to get a multiple different things. You're trying to get a Tribune. You're trying to get a Centurions, um, or Gladiators, I'm sorry. You're trying to get money. And there's multiple things determined by a victory point card. And you do that by getting, controlling different organizations with your worker placement. And all that's done using money and other tokens, but a majority of it is done by using cards. Here's a card about the Senators uh, trying to control that faction. I have other cards in here where you control the Praetorians or the Plebeians. And all this fits together. You're playing cards, trying to outfit other people, trying to control as many groups as you possibly can. And when you control a group, you then get their special power, and then you use that to get the things that you need to win the game. All this fits together in a very quick way. The game doesn't take that long, even with five players. And I really felt interaction, even though worker placement games don't usually have that. Look at this. They even have a uh, this this uh, chariot piece is completely overproduced game in, in some senses. They, this is just to block one of the factions. But it, it's great. Wonderful. I enjoy it quite a bit. And that's why Tribune is my number 55. Great game uh, designed by the designer who did uh, Demacher. Number 54 is a game I, another new game to the list, and this is Pandemic. Pandemic is a game of stopping diseases. Um, you have a map of the world in which and all players are working cooperatively to stop diseases from spreading and taking over the world. The diseases, unfortunately, are little cubes. I saw a uh, homemade version with zombies, and I thought that would be really great to own. It was trying to stop the zombie infections all over the world. But... Each person has a different role. One person might be the medic. One person might be the scientist. And you're working together. Now, in this, I like cooperative games with a traitor. That's why Shadows Over Camelot is so good. But in this one, I don't know why. Maybe it's because the theme is fun. And, I mean, you, you really feel like you're trying to stop the world from, from being destroyed. But it's so hard. There's three levels of difficulty to the game. Uh, on the easy level, I beat it. Now that I've played the game quite a bit, beat it about 80% of the time. On the medium level, I still haven't beaten it yet. Yes? Okay, okay, thank you. But <laughs> anyway, um, and on a hard level, I don't even know if that's possible to beat the game. And yet we play it time and time again. Great two-player game, great four-player game. Really enjoy Pandemic. I feel like I've done something good after playing it. We have stopped the world's diseases. And so there's that. It's a pretty nice production in a small box. It works together really well. So Pandemic is number 54. Number 53 is a small game, Ink and Gold. Now, Ink and Gold is one of those games that I really wish was slightly better produced because in it you have a handful of, I don't know, is that candy? Yeah, it looks like candy, though. Uh, but they're, they're basically jewels that you're trying to get, and each player has a card that they fold in half to make their tent, and they'll be hiding the jewels that they get underneath that tent. Uh, I'll push it up here so you can oh, uh, push it back so you can see it there. You hide the jewels under the tent. Okay, that works. And the turning card aspect over works, but it, it just feels like it should be a better production. And yet, even with that lower production, it's still really high on my list, and that's because it fits up to eight players and does it well. Players are basically pushing their luck. Everyone's going through this, um, going into the Incan treasure trove cave, and you go in one card at a time. And you can pull out at any time and take all the jewels that you've gotten so far or you can keep going in, hoping to get more and more. But if you go in too far and the right combos of cards are turned over, then you then the tunnel collapses or snakes get you or whatever, and you don't get anything at all. So it's a push-your-luck game. And with eight people, eventually it whittles down to maybe three, two. Then there's one guy pushing his luck as far as he can go. Lots of fun. Very enjoyable. I brought it out time and time again. And even though there's all this good candy, want some candy, to eat in the game, it's just... Even with these low-quality components, people beg to play it again and again. Uh, note, there is an earlier version of the game 
which does have better quality components. But still, for a good price, a small game, eight people, you can't go wrong. Number 52 is a tie. Now, I don't try not to have ties very often, but these two games use the same basic mechanic, which I really enjoy, and I really can't tell you which one I like more. One day I'll tilt towards the one, the other time I'll tilt towards the other. The first is No Thanks, and the second is Las Co, I believe is how you pronounce it. In both games, they use bidding in the sense that this one, of course, Las Co has better components, and this one has stones, and No Thanks has chips. And in both of these, when you bid, you must take the middle card, you put a chip down to stay in the bidding, or you take all the chips when you pull out. So I'll put down a chip. Holly will put down a chip, the next player will put down a chip, and eventually the pile of chips gets in the middle, and you're tempted to pull out. And no thanks, pulling out gets you the card, which gives you points, which you don't want. In Nasco, pulling out gives you the uh, less chance of getting cards. In Nasco, you want cards, because at the end of the game, matching sets of animals gets you points. No thanks is a simpler game. It's very easy for me to teach. Both of them are, are very easy to come across, but... I have to, again, I don't know. I, I really, I think Las Cove has some deeper strategy in it and probably works well over the long run, but no thanks, it's such a good game in a small box. This is the one that I end up taking more often to uh, places with me. This is the one that I end up taking with me pretty much to every gaming event I run because it's small, it fits in a box well, it handles up to five people, and it's so quick to teach. I've seen people play it differently. Risk players will play it very aggressively, even though it hurts themselves. Other people will play it more passively, and yet everyone has a good time. Las Co, it's, the theme isn't really the most interesting in the world to people, and it's a little more wonky in mechanics, and yet I feel like it's a better game overall. So again, that's why they tie. That's why I have a hard time deciding which one's better. So they tie for number 52. Number 51 is a really sad affair. It's a game I don't have. I wish I owned it. I wish I had a copy, but I don't. And that's Kremlin. Now, I grew up in the 1980s, and therefore, I really was aware of the Cold War. And there's many good games about the Cold War. But Kremlin is just about the USSR and all the backbiting and all the fighting that went on in the Kremlin there. And it does it in a really fun way. It's almost, in a sense, a Euro game. Thank you. It's almost, in a sense, a Euro game, but at the same time, it's it's... It was done way back in the 80s. This game was designed. And so it has a bit, few wonky mechanics and maybe shoddy components from Avalon Hill at the time. And I really wish a company would pick it up and republish it, even though since the Cold War is, is over, um, it doesn't seem to be as... The demand for that theme isn't as high. But yet it's, it was so enjoyable because it was a backstabbing game. Each play, There were several different people in the cabinet. One person was in charge. Another person was in charge of the KGB. And, and there was different people in charge of different places. And you had influence on these folks. But the influence you had was secret, and you didn't have to uh, reveal all the influence you had. So you, I might be controlling the KGB, and you might be allowing me to control the KGB, because you, you don't want to show your hand yet, just in case someone decides to cart them off to Siberia. And there's so much backbiting, so much fighting, you're never sure who controls what. And the game is just really immersive. I'm not sure it's for people who don't want treachery in their games, but... You can get it on eBay for a pretty decent price, and I guess I should pick it up because it's one of the few games in my top 100 that I don't own, but I wish I did. And so number 51 is Kremlin for me from Avalon Hill. There we go. We're halfway there. Those are my 51 to 100 now that I've gone over. Great games all, but I'm telling you, it gets even better. I mean, we're talking now, we're going into my top 50 games. These are 50 games that I would never get rid of. I mean, believe me, the, one, the five I just talked about, I won't get rid of them either, except Kremlin, which I don't have, so I can't get rid of it. But these 50 that are coming up, man, they're just they're, they're so good that I don't even know why I'm not talking about them yet. Anyway, from the Dice Tower, I'm Tom Vassell, and this is Holly, and we'll see you guys next time.